you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks, Amit. Yes. Um, this is both a conversation and a thread uh, that has been running in uh, for about uh, three years. Uh, so much of what I'm going to talk about is drawn upon um, our own Scribble's own journey, uh, building um, uh, feature engine platform and talking to a lot of uh, uh, customers. I can see a couple of my customers. Uh, thank, thank you. And uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to learn. Um, this is, uh, these are the set of questions that a fictitious uh, customer of ours uh, had. Uh, some, uh, some time back. And uh, these are questions that a lot of you might be thinking about uh, because uh, uh, there has been a very significant shift in the last uh, uh, year, year and a half or so. Um, until recently, the conversation was about, can we build uh, models? Can we build interesting models, uh, you know, in which we have confidence and so on. Now, we are, the conversation is shifting to, can I make them trustworthy? Can I make them uh, um, uh, robust enough so that I can run them every day and the business can actually depend on all of them? So these are some of the questions. Uh, uh, the, my customers were looking at uh, what Uber is investing. Uber has 400 data scientists and 25 people team only for their uh, ML engineering uh, platform. And they're looking at them and saying, is that, is that the kind of investment? Is, um, why is it so complex? Why is it so, um, uh, why is it so difficult to build? Uh, and, and on and on. Uh, the idea here is that uh, we'll give you a perspective on uh, this uh, uh, cost and complexity and dive into the feature engineering, one of the components uh, of the platform. Hopefully, you will walk away with uh, uh, at least partial answers to whether or not you should build and what could it be, right? How could it look, right? So, a um, little bit about us. Uh, we are an ML engineering company based in Bangalore and for about uh, we've been in existence for about uh, three three years. Um, let me jump right into it. Um, this is a slide from uh, uh, Achal's presentation. Achal is from Uber's uh, Michelangelo team. Uh, he gave a talk very much at, at this very venue about uh, a year back. Uh, and uh, Michelangelo stands out in terms of its design as well as uh, in terms of its uh, sheer capability, 5,000 models. Uh, crunching petabytes of um, uh, data and uh, uh, serving insane number of uh, requests. Um, what has happened in the last uh, one year, much of uh, this was built in-house, but in the last one year, uh, company after company, all the names that uh, we are uh, familiar with and who are doing great work have been coming out and discussing uh, their, uh, uh, the architectures of the, of the system. The most recent one being uh, the rail yard from uh, Stripe. My, uh, my strong recommendation is that uh, uh, these uh, uh, designs, the ideas underlying them reflect uh, some of the uh, cutting edge uh, thinking. And we have personally uh, benefited a great deal from that. And you should also look at them for uh, inspiration. Now the question is, um, uh, we, we know something about the Michelangelo, which is that um, it took 20, 25 people over a period of many years uh, to build it. The question is, what did they actually build? Right? We can talk in terms of technologies, but can we separate out the hives and the Kafkas of the world and look at the core ideas? Um, when we started uh, uh, looking at comparing all the ML platforms that uh, various organizations have uh, built over a period of time, and we started arriving at our own understanding. But luckily for us, uh, Google has already articulated uh, some of this. It was, uh, this is a picture from uh, a paper from a new, new IPS conference from 2015. It was somewhat uh, controversial because um, uh, essentially what this um, uh, uh, picture showed is that all the stuff that we talk about, that is the blog material, the, uh, all the nice charts that we have talked about, uh, what it is saying is that it's actually a small fraction of the effort that goes into putting models into real production. What is the rest of the system doing if it is not uh, uh, crunching statistics and it is not uh, scikit-learn code? And uh, when we looked at them uh, very closely, we, we found that uh, the reason um, all of these things exist is that uh, there, is, uh, there is a degree of uncertainty associated with this ML code. And all of these components are about achieving four objectives uh, related to the same uh, ML code. The first one is speed. 
this comes from the realization that nobody builds one model we are going to build more and more more models uh, every passing day if it is going to take a long time for you to build something then uh, the cost of actually impacting the business is uh, the the value of impacting the the business is much lower than the cost that goes in so uh, one of the major purposes of all of these uh, tools is to put more and more models in production you may not be doing 5000 models like uh, uber but you are definitely doing 25 30 models every organization that uh, we have seen that can conceptualize uh, one model can easily conceptualize uh, 10 models because they have the scale the complexity and the data to uh, meet all of those uh, requirements the second problem is is uh, correctness which is that um, uh, it is not enough uh, uh, to put this ml code uh, into production many of them are making very de risky decisions um, we have um, uh, we know of um, uh, one entity which can uh, whose ml model can effectively deny you a telecom connection a loan um, uh, they can mark you as a fraud these are uh, risky decisions that have a lot of uh, uh, impact and side effects uh, in the world and it impacts real people so you want to know that uh, you can actually believe this uh, ml model that you are putting into production so bunch of the tooling is around i know that i have deployed the right one i know that it is performing well and i know that uh, i can trust it a month from now two months from now five months from now the third one is evolution this has to reflect uh, this reflects the the idea that our understanding of what problem we are solving and how we are solving is actually incomplete when we put the model into production it will evolve as you see more corner cases as you uh, get more data so uh, um, the uh, you have to take the entire system along as you version these uh, 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 ml uh, models over a period of time and the last one is of course scale which is the most talked about which is that all of these are computing uh, large volumes of data so you need to have some sense of uh, some control and uh, scaling ability uh, of this um uh, but the challenge that we have is that um, uh, uber's uh, ml platform is very very specific to uber how much of it is actually usable by us the same is the case with stripe and uh, these are all uh, uh, unicorns which have very very unique problems and so we be, we were thinking about what is it that we can learn from all of this and our own experience because we were building uh, these uh, uh, ml engineering uh, platforms so um, it, it turns out that uh, there was this uh, fantastic presentation from gojek at um, uh, databricks uh, conference uh, in april uh, which had an one one nice slide and you can see that uh, what there, there is a broad convergence there are three big problems that are being solved by the the ml platforms the the first one has to do with the training of the models itself you know all the scikit learn code tracking all the versions of it training uh, tracking all the accuracy levels um and and so on and doing this in a scalable fashion especially if it involves deep learning um, and so on the second part has to do with once we have trained the models and they are actually in a database of some sort taking it and putting it into production and making sure that uh, it is running all the time and we are able to monitor the drift uh, and whatever other um, uh, aspects of interest of the model the third piece which is the feature engineering which is that uh, today uh, with every uh, what we are finding is that uh, in organization of organization people have stopped working on new algorithms the set of uh, statistical methods that you use is uh, reducing and it is standardizing more and more of the model behavior is determined by the underlying data sets so there is an entire piece that that is about generating and managing and tracking those data sets broadly we call it uh, uh, feature engineering now you can map this into direct products uh, in the market already ml flow comes uh, in mind there is a talk on ml flow later and the databricks uh, folks are also outside please uh, talk to them please uh, um the kubernetes and the kubi flow and there is a boff on that as well the part that uh, we felt uh, was uh, did not receive enough attention is the whole part which involves the the data preparation or the feature matrix generation that goes into uh, these models so the rest of the four talk will be only about uh, this uh, leftmost uh, piece and we can talk about other uh, other things uh, later on and there is a boff uh, later today on ml platforms 
there are some fantastic guys uh, from Walmart, Swiggy, and other places who are coming and talking about their ML platforms. Please uh, join us for that. Now, the question is, you know, what does feature engineering, uh, um, uh, what is feature engineering, right? Um, uh, this is how Acme's data actually looks. These are just transactions. Somebody bought uh, some product of a certain kind. But um, what we really want is a large matrix with a bunch of different columns. Columns like, is this, you know, what percentage of the transactions uh, uh, go to the premium products or exotic products uh, and, and so on. Now the big change, the reason you need uh, full-fledged infrastructure and uh, for this uh, feature engineering is that um, if you uh, look at uh, what has been happening, the first thing is that uh, the set of features that you're computing has been exploding. Earlier we would have 15 column, 20 attributes. Now thousands is something that people are easily imagining and these are changing continuously. So depending upon the, the number of models and the kind of models and the methods uh, that, that you're using. The other thing that is happening uh, is that um, uh, new data is coming in, new customers are coming in every day. So whatever be your uh, feature data, feature matrix that you're computing, you need to compute it every day or at a uh, fairly high, high frequency. And uh, there are extreme cases also. Uh, we have an automotive customer where they're building hundreds of these models. It is not even feasible for them to go and uh, manually feature engineer uh, their system. So there's a lot of uh, use of uh, auto ML and uh, automatic uh, feature uh, development and so on. So the, the, you have to see, uh, until recently, this whole feature engineering was subsumed by the data scientists and it was uh, a part of your scikit-learn code. With every passing day, as you're putting more models and as the cost of this uh, activity is growing, uh, it is emerging as a activity in itself. So today, Michelangelo, for example, has a full-fledged team doing this. And uh, that may not be the case uh, in most of uh, your organizations, but you should see this as a fairly standalone uh, uh, activity. And, and you'll understand over a period of time uh, in the next few slides uh, on why. Now, uh, when you look at uh, the feature engineering systems that have been built for um, uh, all of these uh, organizations, what we find is that there are two big drivers uh, to decide what will be the architecture or what will be the flavor of the system that you are going to build. One has to do with what is the sheer scale at which you are operating. If you are operating at petabytes, that's an entirely uh, different system. You have to uh, engineer it uh, to, the, to the maximum. Uh, the second part has to do with uh, how closely tied are your uh, modeling uh, strategies with the uh, feature matrix itself. In deep learning, you may not be able to uh, decouple these. And most of us fall into the top left category. We are dealing with terabytes uh, of data and we are dealing with um, uh, standard uh, ML modeling. Now, um, what we find is that this is actually a large space. There are, there are many more uh, that are coming. One immediate uh, subspace that we see even within ML is, um, we had an IoT customer uh, that has a billion rows with five columns. The way you will process that is going to be very different from our uh, retail customer that has a million rows and uh, 60 columns. The computational requirements as well as the interfaces that you provide are going to be very, very different. So, and this is just the, the beginning. Uh, depending upon whether it is on the edge or in the core, in real time versus not real time, whether it is uh, automatic versus non-automated. Um, uh, this itself, you'll see a bunch of uh, a new discussion over the next uh, um, uh, two, three years. Um, the, let me jump into the, you know, what we have found over, over a period of time. Um, and so essentially the, the whole feature engineering platform or service, whatever we are talking about, ha takes the raw data, transactions, logs, event files, whatever it may be, and then turning that into large matrices, which are called the feature matrices. And there may be even a repository of all of these because oftentimes uh, the, the, um, you want to know features at a point in time. Three weeks back when I trained this model, what were the features? Those are the kind of questions. And 
when you look closely at this uh, you will find that there are actually three sub problems uh, within even within the the feature chain the core we it is intuitive and we understand what, what it is that there has to be one piece which has to do all the the um, uh, processing of the raw data and generate uh, that features and it looks a lot like dag because this code tends to be fairly complex in one uh, customer uh, case uh, this is an iot customer uh, we had 6000 lines of pandas code right um and this is and the the code would run for about 24 48 hours um, and uh, it is a not possible to unit test uh, uh, any of this so it had to be broken up into small pieces they had to be uh, organized uh, in a in a certain way we'll get into a uh, little more of this the second uh, part um, as the risk associated with uh, this modeling uh, is is uh, growing um you want to actually know that uh, it has computed correctly right um you want to be able to access and look at any data set that has been used to train uh, any model because if the questions don't come today they were they are going to come tomorrow it may be from your uh, uh, ceo it could be from regulatory authorities it could be from uh, uh, anywhere so the second part has to do with we actually believe what has been computed the uh, an equally important piece is you know this is computationally intensive it's a uh, it is also a very painful process you first want to know that uh, your data is uh, trustworthy in to the last customer um, uh, every customer's data sources are um, uh, problematic in some way or other in the case of our retail customers uh, gaps in data duplicates uh, errors changes in formats all of this is is a given but you know we used to think that uh, uh, sensor data is little more clean because it is being generated by machines but they have their own set of problems uh, the sensor getting locked at a certain place even the the manual process involving uh, the sensors themselves uh, uh, is uh, Uh, that also is uncontrolled for example we had uh, some sensors coming from a mall the staff would walk around and turn off the sensors right so the sensor it also is not a problem the process around the sensor uh, is still problematic in all cases um, if we one take away one obvious take away um, that uh, uh, you know i i recommend is be paranoid paranoid at every step of the way you don't believe what has been uh, given to you. you don't believe what has been uh, uh, what you are outputting so having a lot of checks and balances through the entire life cycle is what is required and if you ask what is it that uh, uber and uh, railyard and everybody else does it is a lot of error checking code all over the place right that's one way of thinking about uh, what what they do now um let's uh, we will zoom into each one of these depending upon how much um, uh time there is and then i'll give you some high level questions for you to think about uh, uh how to build this so the important thing is that when i was talking about uh, acme right um unlike uh, the flip cards of the world ubers of the world most organizations are already burdened they don't have the the ml engineers that are required ml engineers are half data scientists with a lot of system skill that's a very small intersection right um because they have to understand sufficiently about modeling to be able to build the right uh, right kind of uh, uh, systems and so every customer is is facing uh, resource limitations when they're thinking about building all of this and of course uh, chaf uh, uh, churn and stuff is almost like a, a given and the the amount of compute that they have to do every day is also growing so you um uh, you you have to think very carefully about um, uh, building this uh, system because it is all sunk code it is all technical debt that you are uh, undertaking uh, right now so you know talk a little bit about uh, uh, feature uh, richness right no what do what do we want right so this is how acme's uh, data over a period of time looks we talked about the same uh, two columns you know day one day through it is computing and suddenly day three the version changes because we drop the old column and we get a new column and uh, acme had um, 10 pipelines each of which was generating 10 datasets like this and they're all going through versions 
So you can uh, quickly notice that the number of combinations, uh, you know, by the time uh, a year of runs easily generated about 40,000 data sets. Now imagine tracking them, who knows which model, which version of which model you are trained with which of those 40,000 uh, uh, data sets, right? So um, the first problem that uh, you will uh, encounter, if you will, is uh, how do I compute this reliably? And in a, a fashion where I can, uh, uh, I, I get some sense of uh, confidence. And essentially, you're talking about a set of capabilities. We all know Pandas. We all know Spark. That, those are the core compute engines to generate the the, um, uh, the features themselves. Now, what is what is missing in Pandas? Right? There's a bunch of this. The first one is the ability to break up this complex uh, code. Like I was saying, the um, our uh, IoT customers. Uh, um, a manipulation, feature engineering code was about 6,000 lines of pandas, right? No way in hell you are going to be able to test uh, that kind of uh, code in one go. So you need an ability to um, uh, break up this complex uh, multi-step process into individual modules, each of which can be tested and they can all be stitched together with parameterization. It is common that you will recompute all the features, features for some areas and not others. Um, you will uh, uh, override um, uh, some parameters and not others. There's a bunch of, due, the operations of the pipeline uh, is an activity in itself, right? So you need a set of capabilities around that. The state management has to do with the fact that when there is this uh, complex piece of code uh, multi uh, that is operating in a multi-step process, you need uh, data frames that move from one uh, module to another module to another module, and each of which is enriching, modifying, dropping, is doing something interesting, right? So the state management is again missing. The Of course, I talked about uh, the pandas. Uh, so you, whatever be your mechanism, you're talking about getting this set of four capabilities. And we can talk about what technology combination will uh, get you these uh, things. Uh, but these are, you know, you, you have to think versions, you have to think about uh, documentation, and uh, lastly, resource management around all this. The second part has to do with, uh, which came to us slightly later uh, in the journey, which is that uh, it's actually laborious writing writing all of this code. And our uh, features keep growing, shrinking, changing over a period of time. And so over a period of time, we have moved from uh, Pandas code like this, which defined uh, some of the features, to more like a specification language. Each customer, literally, we define a new specification language where the data scientists or the engineers are able to express very compactly. And one big thing is that um, um, the number of errors reduced. If you know, you know, uh, we all know that uh, in Pandas, a single line of uh, code can uh, do a lot of heavy lifting, right? So imagine 6,000 lines of code and you figuring out, uh, you know, how to make it uh, fairly robust. And specifications uh, is probably the way to go. So you should think in terms of how do I make it really easy for data scientists to say what needs to be computed and separate it out from how and keep the how very simple so that it becomes uh, robust over a period of time. Remember, the one reason this all matters is that uh, um, the systems, the production systems that we are talking about have to be, ha have to run every single day. And there are real applications that depend on the outputs of it. So. Uh, you need to uh, invest uh, in the kinds of mechanisms that uh, that allow you over a period of time the the ROI. Then we can talk about uh, what are the different ways to uh, uh, specify the DSLs. Uh, Gojek has an open source called Feast. It has its own specification language. You may want to look at it. Uh, the uh, languages from the other platforms are not very clear, but we know that there is something uh, of uh, something like Gojek. Um, so this will be, uh, you should expect that in the next uh, two, three years, uh, there will be new open source, new specification languages that are cross-organization, simply because uh, there, is, there are some standard patterns here. It is not that it is completely custom to every single organization. So the, the this is an underappreciated, um, you know, capability that uh, you need. What we found is that uh, in, in the case of, um, our uh, a retail customer, they actually had anthropologists. 
who knew when you bought haldiram's certain flavored uh, uh, bujia they could tell a lot about you as you know individual family the culture the location and so on so there was a lot of tacit knowledge which the the uh, organization had they wanted to first ingest all of that uh, information and be able to link it to features because then the features become really rich right imagine they wanted they had uh, in one case they had 15000 uh, sku's and they want to tag every one of the 15000 sku's with aroma and don't ask me what is aroma of uh, ata but you know they had ideas about uh, um, the signal that was contained in it and uh, we have found that in every one of those uh, every one of the cases uh, customer cases there is tacit knowledge you will have to have a mechanism to ingest this uh, third party information in the organization itself so please uh, plan for it you can use um, you know third party int integration uh, or uh, you can build one these are not uh, uh, complicated but today in our platform for example you know after the first couple of cases it was very obvious and we make it out of box now right you will you'll get that right whether or not you use it this gets uh, into more interesting part which is that you know i have had so many pipelines they have so many runs over the past so much time each one of which generates a lot of data now where is all this data and uh, what do you know about uh, this data how did we arrive at it we are talking lineage we are talking auditability and all of those kinds of things so um uh, we found that uh, without these mechanisms we were spending almost uh, 20 30% of our time Uh, just reconciling data where did a number come from so what happens is that invariably whenever you generate a number there will be somebody in the organization who will disagree with that right you said uh, our return rate was 2.5 but your number is showing 3 you have to be able to defend those numbers it is going to happen in every organization because uh, what we found is that the organizational processes are very indisciplined there are lots of uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in excel lot of stuff happening in emails and lots of conventional wisdom about what the facts are in a given organization so you will you should expect that uh, if you, if there are metrics uh, that you are computing there are battles ahead to prove that this is actually the real metric right and you should have the mechanism to do it and so this this gives you some some thinking right uh, you know this is saying what are all the some of the important decisions that the pipeline has made before it arrived at the the feature set and this is exactly where it is and by the way there is checksum you you uh, are training a model you have to come back uh, to me with the checksum so that i know that the correct uh, uh, training data set then from there we can go look at the logs audit logs and the dependencies and get to the ultimate even the last record that has been used to generate this so we found this to be uh, incredibly useful it shaved off almost uh, uh 20 30% of our uh, time that goes in because a single ask about number can you will end up spending days getting to that uh, underlying truth right so um of course uh, lots of um, validation which is one of the things that was uh, that we felt was uh, missing in in pandas um it does this uh, uh, manipulations of the data frame but how do you know that the output data frame is is what you expected we are talking about even something as simple as counting the number of records right it starts from there and then from there you are looking at the distributions uh, of the if you are sampling for example the customers uh, how does the distribution look compared to the original uh, distribution and so on these are all checks that uh, you need to build over a period of time whether you do it in the in the pipeline code or post that in um, uh, audit and other search interfaces that is all um, uh, you know uh, you you can decide what uh, what is the best way to do it so one of the things that uh, we provided because invariably when a model is not performing well the first question is is it the model or is it the data right once the debugging of the the code of the model is concerned it will immediately comes to data now what has changed between today and yesterday why did the model give a different uh, answer today compared to yesterday so these are uh, so there's a bunch of tooling around all of these things right uh, figuring out the drift of both the model as well as the the underlying data sets maybe the the version of the um, uh, code that generated the feature matrix itself has changed and that could be the source of the problem 
so we don't in our system for example uh, you don't go and manipulate any of the code on the server the code directly gets uh, deployed uh, from github we actually track the git commit that is generating that output so that you can literally link it back to the code and see what has generated now all this uh, is in in many cases it is it is nice to have but what we have found is that this gives us immense confidence that we are actually computing correctly and that allows us to have a lot of uh, uh, good conversations with uh, data data scientists data scientists typically are overburdened they have a lot of uh, models to develop they keep moving from model to model it is hard for them to remember the choices uh, that uh, they have made and uh, uh, imagine somebody coming uh, to the data scientist and saying okay 3 months back you scored uh, uh, you rejected the loan application of somebody can you tell me why you have rejected right that is that's a very long drawn out very painful process so all of this will help with uh, some of those uh, questions um this is uh, again this uh, uh, like i was saying you never build one model you're always building multiple uh, models and second uh, there is no customer of ours who doesn't have a very very aggressive uh, data science roadmap they're all hiring everybody right um uh, we are happy to do the good samaritan thing if you are available please let us know we we know fantastic customers where you can go uh, help solve some of their problems so in uh, so we are we are talking about how do you uh, avoid reuse how do uh, sorry how do you avoid uh, duplication of the work right so um, one of the capabilities uh, that you need uh, as part of this platform and within your organization is to discover what exactly are you computing in your system as of today right there are many pipelines on many different systems right what did it uh, what are all these uh, achieving so having a single place where I, where i say okay this is the feature this was being computed by this and uh, it is available this and by the way this is this is the statistical distribution then you can immediately say okay i have uh, uh, features that i can use for my model i maybe i have to ask for new features and that's a nice conversation to have but it starts with do you even know what is happening uh, in your current system so the the uh, what we have found over a period of time is that the first ver version of the model is uh, you know really opens up a set of uh, questions involving how are you going to uh, nurture it over the next one year two years right and uh, you have to think through all of uh, these different problems that we have talked about and the different mechanisms uh, uh, that uh, we have we have discussed now um input correctness actually is is uh, somewhat my uh, favorite um because i hadn't appreciated how dirty and messy the data is you get stuck here right um the modeling does not even begin before you have an understanding of what is in your data and whether it is complete and correct right in most cases they don't even know what is in the data simply because the organization is very large in one customer case um there was a transaction table that was coming in with some 60 or uh, 80 columns and uh, this is these are from old uh, siemens nixtoff pos machines that these uh, this company had deployed all over the place nobody actually documented what those columns are if it has sometimes it has you know 10 zeros sometimes it has two zeros um so it took almost two to three months just to know what is in the data right your data science has not even begun so one of the the uh, recommendation thinking i would uh, strongly urge to you is that if you don't have a handle on your uh, input data forget about the rest of the model because uh, you uh, distrusting data is 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 really important um, as a as a principle don't don't use it until you have uh, verified it and uh, there are lots of stability issues sometimes it comes sometimes it doesn't come sometimes it comes with duplicates or format has changed we don't know whether that has correctness implications on the on the model so we uh, um there is no i mean there are some uh, open source libraries to check validate uh, data but uh, there is no obvious and a simple system that will apply in all contexts so we build in every one of the cases a health uh, check right that you know validates the data before it goes through any of this uh, pipelines 
I mean, remember that this is all happening after all the Kafka's and the data has reached the the data lake or your database or whatever is the storage mechanism. These are checks beyond whatever they do. Um, this I've already talked about. Um, uh, there was a case when um, uh, the models were uh, getting messed up and we started looking at the, uh, the data. And uh, so we found that there was uh, some significant change in a date time column, uh, uh, date time column or totals column one of some column in the in the database and so we went back to the organization and said tell me about this this column oh sir like you, you didn't realize in in 2013 we had a developer change that uh, person changed the semantics of that particular column earlier it meant this now it means this and that information is embedded in all their excels right the tacit knowledge and the business rules that were there and here we are struggling we struggled for almost two or three weeks trying to make sense out of the data. The moment we knew what we had to go back and tell the, the customer, I mean, we are sorry, your 100 GB of uh, uh, transaction data from 2013 and 14 cannot be used because they are not comparable. And then we had to uh, go off and do other stuff. I can see that some of, <laughs> uh, some smiles. I think the, the um, it, it, it um, as as uh, data scientists in the in the data community, right? As as we progress, um, uh, it will help if we move from the the fanciest part of the whole data science, which is the model themselves, to understanding it at a systems level, and having a, a end to end uh, control. Because the, you know, in in most cases, the 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 models are useless if you uh, if your data is messed up. Um, let me move on to uh, some other stuff. Um, this is the key thing that uh, you have to take away. From. There is economics of feature engineering. It is upfront and it grows non-linearly with uh, the number of features and each feature is very expensive. Right? With these in mind, you have to ask what additional value does each feature? If a data scientist say, I want to come up with a new model and the person wants a new feature to be computed, you have to ask, why? If I didn't have this feature, how, what would be the accuracy with the feature? What would not? What would be the accuracy? Does the ROI on the the uh, model uh, justify the kinds of investment uh, that you have to put in to keep this uh, thing up and running every day? Um, it should not surprise you that only one in about fifty models go into production, right? And I think that. When we uh, we start asking the hard questions only when we think in terms of the production, right? We know the famous uh, Netflix uh, case, right? Where the recommendations uh, they were they were they gave a million dollars for improving the recommendations and so on. I believe that it did not go into production. The complexity of the implementation of the alternative algorithm was way higher than the the value of it uh, that it could deliver. Okay. Five minutes. Right? So um, you want to ask a lot of questions. How many models will I have? What kinds of complexity? Will the features be simple or very, very complex, right? And um, whether I have uh, uh, mechanisms like uh, Google BigQuery where I, can, where I can compactly represent some of these features or do I have to write a lot of Spark code to be able to do all of these things? And of course, uh, how much volume are we, are we talking about? Uh, this goes back to again uh, the economics uh, of of the feature engineering. In all cases, what we find is that uh, beyond a certain scale, you will need a feature engineering platform simply because the you cannot do it on your laptop anymore. You cannot. Um, you have to be able to reuse across uh, models. Um, so pretty much every large organization that you uh, know of has uh, built their own uh, ML platform overall, and within that, a feature engineering platform. So um, uh, you want to think about um, what will be the, the roadmap and at what point you want to uh, uh, build your own. And if you want to do it today, uh, we are early in the, the development of this whole space. Uh, if you want to do it today, there are really only three options. Uh, Gojek has open sourced a tool co-authored by Google uh, called Feast, uh, but it is uh, very, very GCP specific. right? Um, there is, you can build your own um, 
but you know, it, it takes a very significant amount of effort to stitch all of these very different systems that have not been designed for uh, feature engineering in um, uh, as, as a end, end purpose. And the last one, there are wonderful companies like ours uh, uh, which can do it, uh, but you know, commercial products have their own uh, set of limitations, costs, uh, and, and, and so on. I expect that over the next um, uh, one, two years, uh, you'll see a lot more conversation, a lot more open source, a lot more of our kind of uh, companies. Um, one of the reasons uh, uh, we developed it early because uh, we came at it from a um, data scientist standpoint. We were wrangling a lot of data, doing a lot of modeling, and then we realized that uh, we need a, um, a ML platform of our own. So we built one initially in my previous company. From there, we said, no, this is the first version. This looks terrible. Let me go off and to the drawing board, think about it, and rebuild a, a version of it um, ourselves, which we call the, the LH. Okay. Um, so, you know, you know the standard um, costs and benefits of um, open source versus stitching versus um, your own uh, implementation or even a third party like ours. Uh, my strong recommendation is that um, the ideas are not yet uh, fully developed in this space. People are still feeling their way through and much of those ideas are embedded in the product documentation from each of these companies. You may want to look at them to actually read between the lines and ask what is what is their real objective, right? Is If I change the technology choice, how will it look? If I scale it down, how will it look, right? And uh, there's some fantastic uh, uh, thinking that is uh, uh, going on. Um, I will leave you with uh, quick uh, uh, takeaways. Um, the, the, the key thing is that uh, the difference between, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, the ML engineering of which this is part and the data engineering is that um, it is, it's very, very sensitive to the, the modeling process itself, correctness, scalability, versioning, and all of these things. So the thinking that you need to bring to the table uh, when it comes to ML platform design is uh, different from that of the traditional data engineering. And we'll have a lot more uh, conversation later today in the BOF, and of course, some of us uh, are around as well. Right? You feel free to uh, get in touch with us for for a, you know any conversation around uh, ML systems and productionization. Okay, uh, huge round of applause. Yeah. We can take one or two questions, or one at the best, and then. He'll I'll be, be back after lunch for the combined Q&A. So one question. Okay, hi. hi. Um, quick question. So I, I saw that you moved from code to going to YAML or like some kind of language, right? Um, we'll YAML, take... JSON, I mean, use any, any, anyone. It doesn't really matter what the specification. Yeah. I'll just come down to the stage. I guess it's easier. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One last question and then we'll. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so you mentioned that we uh, we should data validation after after this data lake, which makes all the sense because if we input like dirty data, the model will not learn anything. But I think uh, this data validation would be more important after we do feature engineering because this feature engineering part is still a part where we can introduce a lot of bugs and if we are doing data validation before it, then we might sk skip those errors and so on. Yes, yes, you're, you're right. It is not either or. You do it at uh, not, you do it before, you do it during, you do it afterwards. Oh, at every it step. It pays to be paranoid. I see. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll... Okay. Uh, we break for lunch. We'll be back at uh, 2.20. Uh, just one lost and found on our...